As former speaker of the Lutheran Hour, I had to accomplish a unique task every week. I had to speak to our 1.1 million listeners from around the country, most of whom I would never meet. My challenge was to be engaging right from the beginning of the message because holding the audience was essential from the very first word preached. You never wanted that person in the car or listening at home to change the station because if they did, they'd probably never come back. That challenge was further compounded by the fact that people who were listening were doing so in a culture that was much more aggressively suspicious of the Christian message. Just a generation ago, one could be assured that Christian beliefs or ideals were the deep background of almost all listeners. You could build on a common vocabulary. You could anticipate shared values or shared perspectives on societal issues. You might even share similar goals to living and achieving a meaningful, purposeful life. All that has changed. Today, bombarded by a ubiquitous, secular, post-Christian worldview, many are embracing the post-Christian version of many Christian ideals replacing God as the transcendent foundation to them all with the radical self-authorizing person as the only foundation to their truth. In this segment, we will address sound practices for preaching to and reaching modern post-Christian culture. The methodology that we will use to do that is an adaptation of Tim Keller's engagement methodology in his book, Preaching. Keller and I both serve parishes in New York City where the daily struggle was preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus in a city with thousands of steeples and empty churches. How had a city that used to have churches almost on every block, how had it grown indifferent to the gospel? And what could the preacher do about it? How could a person or a ministry contextualize the message anew in a city that was decidedly post-Christian? Keller describes the work of contextualization this way. It means to resonate with, yet defy, the cultural around you. It means to antagonize a society's idols while showing respect for its people and many of its hopes and aspirations. It means expressing the gospel in a way that is not only comprehensible, but also convincing. I especially like his description of this homiletical work as a movement of yes, no, but yes. The preacher works hard to engage the listener saying yes to many common first article beliefs with his post-Christian hearers. But then he has the work of delivering God's no, showing how these common hopes or dreams cannot be achieved by human effort alone. And finally, his final work is to deliver textually God's ultimate yes. That proclamation that God has come in Christ to redeem and restore what was sinfully lost and broken. Keller gives the example of John using the word logos to proclaim Christ. Logos was a common Greek philosophical term. John affirms, yes, the notion that creation and the history of humanity had purpose and order behind it all. But no, this logos cannot be fully understood or received by human effort because God himself is the logos in the flesh in Jesus Christ. The Logos is not something that you can find through philosophical reasoning because it's not an it at all. It's a him. But yes, the Logos is one we can come to know, to believe, and thus to live. This movement of yes, no, but yes is further expressed as engaging culture on its own terms, confronting culture by those same terms, and turning the cultural narrative toward the gospel with the offer which only comes by grace through faith in Jesus. It's an effort that reframes the culture's questions, reshapes its concerns, and redirects its hopes. To engage the hearts then and minds of people today, one must first start by making sure that the preacher himself doesn't become a barrier to delivering the message. Now, I'm not talking about formalities here, like speaking or not speaking from the pulpit or whether one should wear or not wear robes. Our work is the sermon itself. The challenge is to make sure that the words we use, the examples and the stories we tell, the questions we ask in the sermon itself, these all need to be done with an anticipatory spirit that demonstrates that the preacher knows not only the text, 
but knows the people who are listening too. We engage the post-Christian hearer by using accessible or well-explained vocabulary. Using accessible language means that we don't take the relationship we have with our listeners for granted. We must avoid insider church language, words like covenant, testament, kingdom, justification, sanctification. These words need to be explained, not just proclaimed. Even the core belief of justification by grace through faith in Jesus alone needs to be contextualized for people to understand what is actually being offered. For example, for many today, justify means making excuses or merely asserting one's self-justification. It needs to be fleshed out in its legal sense of being declared righteous, declared innocent because someone else has taken your penalties, your judgment upon himself in your place. Even teachings like Simul Justus Epicator need more than a mere translation as being at the same time both sinner and saint. Keller notes another way of saying this fundamental truth when he says, a Christian is more flawed and sinful than you'd ever dare believe, and yet more loved and accepted than you'd ever dare hope, at the very same moment because of what Christ Jesus has done for you. Another way of being engaging is to affirm cultural authorities that help deliver common language, common hopes, and common dreams of both the scripture and the hearer. Here one notes the Apostle Paul's use of the pagan philosopher Aratus in Acts 17.28 as he speaks to the Greeks in Athens. He affirms their intuitions, even their hopes, but then he turns those hopes finally to Christ alone. Another example that hits closer to home would be words like liberty and freedom. The word freedom is full of expectation and hope. There are many authoritative voices in our culture proclaiming that humans were meant to be free. Yet in comparison to all of these voices, the Bible proclaims that there is only one freedom that lasts, the freedom that comes through faith in Jesus. Galatians 5.1 says that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Paul then begins to explicate how that freedom is meant to be exercised for ourselves and for others. Employing respected authorities of the culture is no guarantee of persuading a skeptical audience, but it will go a long way toward keeping them from tuning you out almost immediately. Finally, engaging the hearer so that we might gain an audience it's wise to try and anticipate people's potential questions, doubts, and fears. As Keller reminds us, the Christian preacher must be a critic of non-belief. However, there is no virtue in being unsympathetic. The preacher must also be aware of post-Christian cultural defeaters, which are ideas in the culture which, if accepted, make one think that if that's true, then Christianity can't be true. Our sermons should be sprinkled with responses to such questions when the need arises. As an example, Keller notes the objection to the Bible as the authoritative Word of God that exists in our culture today. To engage that one, one might say this, I realize how difficult it is sometimes to believe certain things in the Bible, and I realize that people point out that it was a book written by fishermen of all things. But I'd ask you to consider this. What fisherman would write about a cross and a resurrection? What fisherman would concoct stories about miraculous healings where they themselves were the unbelieving witnesses? And what fisherman would admit their short-sightedness and unbelief and then point you only to a savior and not to their philosophies or beliefs? Or one could speak about the authority of the Bible as not mere rules on a page but words for those who have a love relationship with God. Then explain how in any relationship, for it to be genuine, there will be times of misunderstanding. So in reading the Bible, one would expect times when it challenges us because we won't understand everything. Keller says, so an authoritative Bible, the point of contradiction, is not the enemy of a personal love relationship with God, the point of contact. It is the precondition. Initially, in any sermon, 
but especially in sermons to a pulse Christian culture, we demonstrate our love for the listener by framing the delivery of the gospel in words they can understand, authority figures they respect, and challenges and questions they may have in their hearts so that we might deliver God's answer to those very things. With such engagement, we earn the right then to confront the false, secular, pietistic, self-righteous foundations that our hearers and we ourselves have, so that they too might see the gospel as the unique love of God in Jesus Christ for them. Confrontation of the post-Christian narrative is meant to be one that is humbly and sincerely offered because God, out of love, confronts our self-righteous confidence too. We all are 100% sinners who need God's 100% grace in Christ alone. Here Martin Luther's simile used to sepicator is helpful because there is no message of the Bible that we share with others that doesn't also call us to repentance and to faith just as well. Keller calls this the sympathetic accusation. I call this working people's worldview in order to share the gospel. And those who understand the distinction between law and gospel, we know how each word works. God's law rightly calls us to follow it, to enact it in our lives. But faithful exercise of the law does not bring us life, not because the law is unholy, but because we are. Due to the sinfulness of each human practitioner, the law actually winds up accusing us and calling us to repentance. Virtually every worldview that people hold, be it a scientific one, a self-fulfillment one, a personal piety one, a libertine one, a materialistic one, a status one, or a works righteousness one, all are law answers to the big questions in life. Questions like, who am I? Why am I here? And is what I'm doing meaningful and a blessing to those whom I love? Again, all of those worldviews are law-oriented and self-focused answers to the questions that matter in the human heart. The Bible tells us that the law, when it's doing its work, actually kills our self-righteousness. It makes us aware of our incapacity to fulfill even what we think is important in life let alone what God says we must be and do. Sympathetic accusation is a willingness to affirm things like justice, mercy, purpose, dignity, identity, forgiveness, and life, while demonstrating how none of our ways of thinking and acting ever fulfills what we so desperately need. In our final section on applying these principles to the post-Christian worldview, we'll show more concretely how such a confrontation might work. Finally, the main work of knowing the post-Christian culture's affirmations is to put those challenges to work as opportunities for sharing the gospel. It's the work of turning the listener away from the post-Christian cultural answers to the big questions of life by demonstrating that Christ and His work are the fulfillment of what it means to be human for ourselves and for others. Keller says, to complete the process in our preaching, we must show at the very point of this particular narrative how Christianity offers far more powerful resources not only for explaining, but also for fulfilling the aspirations of our life or for dealing with this issue. Only in Christ can any cultural plotline have a happy ending. He alone supplies the final, but yes, that consummates the biblical text and reaches people deep in their hearts. Keller argues that these cultural challenges and questions can actually help us offer the gospel in new and fresh ways. He tells us to make gospel offers that push on culture's pressure points with a passion for those with whom you speak. By this he means that we should utilize the objections or the challenges inherent in the post-Christian worldview to help us explain more deeply the uniqueness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For example, in a culture that promotes self-assertion and self-esteem, forgiveness is incredibly hard to do. 
but in any relationship, forgiveness and self-sacrificial love are necessary for a meaningful relationship with another person. The post-Christian mindset of self-esteem and self-assertion is inadequate to this fundamental need for life and for love. But the heart that is forgiven by grace through faith in a meaningful relationship with God, that relationship now has God's love available not only to oneself, but to others. Such a graced relationship provides a real basis for thankfulness, gratitude, and humility, all which can be put in service to loving others as God in Christ loves us. Only the gospel can provide a selfless esteem that gives us a healthy sense of ourselves, one that can actually help us make sacrifices that make meaningful relationships possible. By reframing the questions, reshaping one's concerns, and redirecting one's hopes and dreams toward the God who loves them in Jesus Christ, this work then entails broadening the post-Christian perspective from its failed baseline assumptions toward the person and work of Jesus Christ for sinners. For example, in dealing with the post-Christian fundamental assertion that all authority is self-referential, one can press that to show how we actually rely on others for much of the way we think and feel about ourselves. And even there, we all tend to let one another down. That discussion can be reframed towards our identity in Christ because of who He is, what He has done, and what He can do through us to others. The last two moves of Keller's methodology, humbly confronting the baseline ideas of the post-Christian narratives for life and the turning of those narratives towards a dynamic presentation of the gospel, that's what we'll illustrate now. We'll look at each narrative and challenge a baseline concern and turn those concerns toward the gospel. The identity narrative. The identity narrative is one that is fundamental to the other post-Christian narratives, so we'll start with that one. It's important to realize that the value of the individual was something that grew out of the Christian worldview in Western culture. As an example, look at the United States Constitution, which asserts the notion that a person has unalienable rights because that person and all persons are created by God. Post-Christian culture seeks to rid God from that equation, literally enthroning the ego of the person, the emotions and desires of the person who must choose to be themselves on their terms alone. But Keller demonstrates that no one can actually do this. Rather, all are choosing to be the selves that culture is telling them they may be. That in the end, one can't name ourselves or bless ourselves. We need someone from outside to say we are of great worth. And the greater the worth of that person who tells us, the more powerful that recognition is to our identity formation. The work of turning the narrative is to recast the identity discussion in terms of God's word and work for that person. The Imago Dei roots one's self-worth and identity in something greater than the utility of one's life or the social position of one's life towards God's work on behalf of that person, to God's naming of that person as a child of God and as an heir of abundant life now and forever. Various biblical metaphors can be put in service of this reframing. Words like redemption, paying the price to free someone, reconciliation, bringing lives back together when they have been split apart. Adoption, receiving the kind of love that brings you out of the terror of life on your own into the family of God with God's promises of His presence and blessing. Here too, the power of baptism as God's provision of applying the very death and resurrection of Jesus to one's life, Romans 6, or the sacramental gifting of God's name onto that person's life, it's a very powerful thing indeed. When Jesus names you, there's power and authority to become what God has created and redeemed you to be. See Keller's book on pages 133 to 139 for more discussion on this. The rationality history narrative is one that glorifies modern humanity as having the capacity to solve the problems that are before us. The homiletical confrontation to this is the reality of humanity's inability actually to do what it says it can do. 
The 20th century is one of great progress in some ways, but it was also a century of incredible brutality in other ways. There are many examples that can be used to show that the modern idea of historical progress has been too optimistic about history and human nature. Also, science has limitations as well. It can only tell us that something is or isn't. It can't assign a moral value to a thing. With science and history as blind guides, one is left either with an overtly optimistic hope against hope notion of life or an overly pessimistic science and technology will destroy us notion of life. The Christian message turns those false hopes toward the resurrection of the crucified one. With the death and resurrection of Jesus as the defining event in history, Christianity can be at the same time far more pessimistic about history and the human race than any other worldview, and far more optimistic about the material world's future than any other worldview. Here one can challenge the listener to know the difference between information and wisdom as well. For more on this topic, see Keller's pages 153 to 155. The society narrative is one that pits post-Christian desire for intimacy against the desire for autonomy. Here the post-Christian worldview begins to gnaw at itself. The post-Christian view of society means that society must be one that does not need to lay down any moral principles at all. It can be value-free. The absolute freedom of the individual must relativize the commitments necessary for family, for friendships, even for society itself. Here one can confront a person's desire for community, family, and love with the reality that the post-Christian individual worldview cannot. It cannot practice what it cannot even preach. Here the turn is toward the Bible's proclamation of love. Love requires sacrifice. Love requires commitment. Love makes demands on the heart, soul, and mind. 1 Corinthians 13 and Colossians 3 show how love is the fulfillment of faith and hope. Love is the binding power in relationships. And finally, true love, perfect love, is God's great gift to humanity on His terms alone. When a person understands that out of love God sent His Son to redeem and restore the world, then the words of Jesus in John 8 really deliver what the post-Christian can never achieve, freedom that comes from love received and freedom that serves in love towards others. For more on this, see Keller pages 140 through 146. The morality justice narrative. The Christian worldview is of course a moral one, so the post-Christian worldview must absolutize this as well. Yet the morality justice narrative is the most suspect of all the post-Christian worldviews. If people are self-authorizing moral agents under no compulsion or commitment to anyone or anything except themselves, the whole notion of morality and justice is re reduced to will and to power. Keller notes that this narrative does not have the moral sources or foundation in which to ground its ideals. It lacks a grounding for motivation, for obligation, and for enforcing any kind of standards beyond one's emotive proclivities. The impulse towards a moral and just society needs then to be turned, turned towards the God who created the world and ordered the world for people's good. The homiletical turn finally needs to point towards the gift of God's love to humans, selflessly as the motivation and the grounding of all truly human activity. Such selfless love also undergirds the moral ordering of the world that calls us to love God and to honor and serve our neighbor in His name as the key to life as human beings who are redeemed in His image. The post-Christian worldview is both a challenge and an opportunity then for Christian preaching. Many of our society's deep-held beliefs are rooted in the Christian worldview, rooted in God's activity in the world to preserve it, to save it, and to restore it. The secular version of that will always be a cheap works righteousness alternative to the real thing. The engage, confront, turn methodology should give the preacher the skill needed to proclaim God's good news anew,
so that post-Christian ears might indeed hear and believe.